My name is Bastian Welch and I'm from the Department of uh, Geothermal Science at the Technische Universität Darmstadt here in Germany. And now we go back to closed geothermal systems and in this case a quite exotic topic, the so-called medium deep borehole thermal energy storages. And um, first of all, I want to give a short introduction why we are looking at medium deep systems. And here I start. Um, yeah, uh, shallow borehole thermal energy storage storages are already state of the art. They are installed in a couple of locations already, also here in Germany, and um, they usually consist of numerous BHEs, which are not deeper than 100 meter, and they usually tap or often tap in um, in shallow aquifers. And as we have a huge thermal impact by the storage of heat in the aquifer, and these aquifers are often also used for drinking water production, we also often have the problem that we don't get any permissions by the water authority for building such systems. So the idea now is that if we drill deeper into the solid rocks underneath these aquifers, um, we can somehow solve this problem um, there are some advantages. We need less floor space on the Earth's surface and by um, maybe installing thermal insulation at the upper parts of the BHEs, uh, we could decrease the thermal impact on these aquifers to a negligible amount. And a further advantage is that usually the solid rocks have a relatively low hydraulic conductivity, so we get um, low convective heat losses out of the system. Well, nevertheless, the systems differ from the shallow ones in shape and um, also in um, in size, and that's why some questions come up uh, concerning the storage performance and um, yeah, how much heat can we store in these systems and uh, what is the storage efficiency of these systems and also how is the storage performance influenced by the underground properties and the storage configuration? And today in my talk, I want to focus, focus on the uh, right side of, uh, on the left side, on the storage configuration. And um, here we did a numerical modeling study on this by um, varying different storage configurations or different parameters, the BHE length, the number of BHEs and the BHE spacing. And combining all these variations with each other, we build up uh, 200 storage models with different geometries. Um, all the models had uh, simplify a very uh, simple general model setup, a box model with temperature boundaries at the top and the bottom slice so that we had a geothermal gradient of 3 Kelvin per 100 meter. And we assigned some underground properties which are typical for the crystalline basement in the vicinity of Darmstadt. And uh, we also had uh, no groundwater flow at this stage in the models. Uh, then we had a very simple operating scenario. Uh, we had coaxial VHEs in the model, um, assigned with the analytical solution um, fee flow offers and a constant flow rate through each BHE. And to get this alternating operation between heat storage and heat extraction, we changed the uh, inlet temperatures every six months between 90 degrees Celsius in the storage period and 30 degrees Celsius in the extraction period. And we did this for a whole simulation time of 30 years. So, and what we already can see here, the solid line is the, the result of, a FIF, of an exemplary fee flow model is that our storage temperatures uh, or the outlet temperatures of the storage increase with time. Uh, to compare our different models with each other, we needed some reference quantities, so we calculated the heat rate from the temperature difference between the inlet and outlet fluid, and from that we could calculate the stored and extracted heat amounts uh, for each year of operation. And uh, if you build the ratio of these both values, you get a storage efficiency, which is a value of 
uh, how much heat can you extract from the heat that you stored before during the same year of operation. Um, okay, let's have a look at the result. Here we have a cross section through, um, through an exemplary storage model. Uh, one before heat, uh, one after heat storage, and one after heat extraction. And what we can see is that uh, even after the heat extraction period, we still have a little heat plume in the underground, so we don't get all of the heat we store back. But this also uh, increases uh, the temperature in the storage from time to time. And if we now have a look at the evolution of the storage performance, um, we can see that um, in red, the stored heat amounts decrease with operation time, and in blue, the extracted heat amounts increase with operation time, and this is due to this continuous heating up of the storage with time. And this results in a strong increase in the storage efficiency during the first years of operation, and even in the 30th year of operation, we still have a slight increase in the storage efficiency. So let's have a look at the amounts of stored and extracted heat for, in this case, the, the no, sorry, that was the wrong button, um, for the number of BHEs and the BHE length. And what we can see is that um, the amounts of heat that we exchange with the underground increase almost linear, linearly with the number of BHEs and with the BHE length. So. The bigger our storage system, the more heat can be exchanged with the underground. And um, yeah, if we look at uh, the extracted heat amounts, uh, we can see that uh, in the smallest storage system, we stored um, about 140 megawatt hours per year. And for the largest system that we looked at, we could store more than 60 gigawatt hours per year, which are huge heat amounts. Um, if we now have a look at the storage efficiency, we can uh, here display it for the variation of the BHE spacing and the BHE length. We can, first of all, we can see that we can reach um, very high storage efficiencies of up to 80% or even more. And what we also can see is that we have a maximum in the um, storage efficiency for a, certain, for a certain BHE spacing. In our case, this was for a spacing of um, 5 meters, but this value is probably highly dependent on the thermal conductivity of the underground. And if we now change and also have a look at the number of BHEs and the BHE length, we can see again that the storage size increases also our storage efficiency, which means the more BHEs we have, the more BHEs can interact with each other and thus increase the storage efficiency and decrease the heat losses. Um, yeah, with this modeling results, um, we, we, we took these results as a databases for an economic analysis. And um, we looked at different scenarios, and this was based as a case study at a campus of our university, where we have, and this was the reference scenario, uh, where we have an actual heating system where we don't have any storage system, and the heat is supplied by a district heating grid um, from a combined heat and power plant. And um, with this scenario, we compared our storage scenarios where we, in scenario one, thought of charging, charging our storage during the summer period by uh, the existing CHP, thus uh, increasing the running time of the CHP in the summer season. And uh, in scenario two, we thought of a solar thermal system, which has to be installed at the campus. Um, yeah, now let's have a look at the earnings that we calculated and that we could have from these systems, in this case from scenario one, and all, um, again for different storage variations. And what we can see that in scenario one, we definitely can earn some money from the system. And 
the main income of the system is that uh, by this increased running time in summer, we also increase the electricity production from the CHP. And this electricity is sold to the grid. So this is the money that we get from this uh, scenario. Um, Aaron, and if we look at the uh, scenario two, where we first have to install our solar collectors, so we have uh, additional um, installation costs for the system, and thus our earnings uh, get negative values, which means that we have to pay additional money for the heat that we get. But what we also can see is that with one to two cents in the best storage configurations, these values are relatively low. Um, and here, if we now have a look at the carbon footprint of the systems, um, we can see that in our scenario one, we increase the carbon dioxide emissions, and this is due to the uh, heat losses that we have from the storage. So we have to uh, burn more fossil fuels than in the reference case. So this is why we increase a bit the carbon, carbon dioxide emissions. And this is where the advantages of scenario two lie, where we could uh, strongly decrease the carbon emissions per kilowatt hour of heat um, yeah. so far. Now let's have a look at the uh, summary and the outlook. I think what we could show with the numerical study was that the medium deep systems are suitable for seasonal heat storage. Uh, we could reach high um, high storage efficiencies and also high specific heat extraction rates. And um, what we also could see is that the storage performance increases with the storage size. Um, then in our economical analysis, we saw for scenario one with the CHP case that we could consider considerably reduce the heat price. Um, and in the second scenario with the solar thermal collectors, we could decrease the CO2 emissions for a relatively small increase in the heat price. So, short outlook, what we still have to do is we have definitely to quantify the thermal impact on these shallow aquifers because this is the main reason why we are looking at these systems. So, this is uh, this we have still to do and therefore we are currently uh, developing a little plug-in which shall allow us to assign uh, insulation crowd zone at the top of the BHE models. And what we also want to do is to couple our models of the storage with models of the overground facility like the heat sources and the heating system. And therefore, we want to couple FIFLO with a MATLAB Simulink in which we uh, model these overground facilities. Um, yeah, that's so far the project-related outlook. And my colleague, Mr. Ruhak, also kindly asked me to mention other, just mention a few of our other IFM developments in our research group where I was not involved so far. Um, we also have a plug-in for mechanical coupling. Um, we are also dealing with the freezing thawing topic and uh, some colleagues work on the uh, chemical coupling with Freak C. Yeah, so far from me and yeah, thank you for your attention.